regular Sunday pews, and some of you are uh, here for tonight's event. I'm delighted to welcome the League of Women Voters and three of our school board candidates uh, today for some lively discussion. We at the First Unitarian Church of Chicago, since about 1836, we gathered up uh, here when there wasn't a whole lot of Chicago around us. And since that time, a couple of things have been important to us. Uh, one is democracy participation, the notion that people have a voice in how they're governed and is near and dear to us. And the other is we've been entangled with this idea of uh, the value of education for everybody, universal education, public education, and it's uh, the idea that it's a human right and that the common wheel is the benefactor of our investment in it. So we a shout out to everyone we have who's uh, participating virtually tonight Hopefully we have that feed. We're also gonna have this recorded, so if you hear things tonight and you want your friends to s see it, uh, that'll be made available, League of Women Voters, and probably on our page as well. With that, I just wanna turn it over to our moderator tonight, Kathleen Mardykes. It will be moderating for the League, and to you. Thank you, Reverend Dave. Thank you. Um, first, just um, so I, I'm uh, one of the vice presidents at the, at the League of Women Voters of Chicago. And just a quick blurb on our organization. The League of Women Voters of Chicago is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and to ensure everybody represented in our democracy uh, is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy and education. And through this forum, we hope uh, we all become better informed about the issues facing our schools and become better acquainted with the candidates uh, running for office. So, um, so let's just start with a few ground rules. Um, we will, um, I think you all look like you're following the rules beautifully. Um, we're gonna, uh, we're looking, uh, sorry guys, you have them with you. Um, and you can refer to them, but I do want to point out just a couple of things. Uh, please do turn off your cell phones, and please no recordings. Um, the, um, you are all asked to withhold your applause and other expressions of support or disagreement uh, during the event. Uh, applause is appropriate at the end of the event. Um, the, uh, I will be asking questions, and every Candidate will get the same question. Fortunately, there are only three of you. Uh, we'll be starting with opening statements of 90 seconds, and we'll go alphabetical. And then we'll have 90 second closing statements, and we will reverse that, okay? Uh, during the, uh, otherwise we'll just be moving the questions down the line, okay? And um, there will be paddles. Uh, all questions will be timed, and you will see the paddles. Uh, if you are um, uh, in the middle of a sentence, you can finish it. Uh, if you are going on and on, um, doing one of those German periodic sentences, you will hear the bell. Where's the bell? Give it a good ring. Yeah. Sounds like something you know, right? <laughs> um, and um, I think that that's enough for us. Uh, We've taken some questions. We'll try and get them in. If you have a question during this uh, period, you can still get it to me, um, and I'll try and I'll try and weave it in if I can. Uh, all questions are directed at all three candidates, and uh, the candidates have uh, said that they would stick around a little bit afterwards uh, if you want to ask them a question directly. Okay. All right. So. This is a little bit different, but um, we're starting with something completely new. Um, so I'm going to take a moment to tell you what is actually going on in case I think a lot of you do already know. But we are uh, we're going to be uh, electing 10 members to a school board, which is going to be expanded from 7 to 21. So this is a transition to a fully elected school board, which will uh, take place in 2027. Um, these uh, 10, uh, whom we elect uh, November 5th, uh, will be joined by 10 appointed by the mayor 
and he will also appoint the president of the board. Um, after the, uh, he will, uh, every of one of these 10 districts is divided into an A and a B, and if the candidate is uh, from A, then he will appoint from the B part of the district. So there will be two from each, each portion of the district, one from each portion of the district. And um, a lot of things are being said about who's gonna do this, who's gonna do the what, so we decided we would just read the job description really quickly, all right? Um, so, and this is from uh, Chicago Public School CPS uh, website. CPS has a budget of more than $9 billion, which is used to serve over 325,000 students across 634 schools. Governing this organization is a tremendous responsibility for the board members selected to lead. Board members fulfill a number of specific key responsibilities, including, but not limited to, hiring and evaluating the CEO, establishing the direction, goals, and priorities for the district, approving district policies, approving purchasing decisions, contracts, and intergovernmental agreements, approving the district budget and capital improvement plan, approving the school year calendar, approving school continuous um, improvement plans, school actions, and school charters and contracts, approving the dismissal of probationary appointed teachers, contract principals, and tenured teachers, and non-probationary educational support personnel. So that is the job description. So now if you, um, uh, did you want to test your mic, Jessica? Sure, good okay. evening. Yeah. So before we get started, uh, we have uh, all three candidates who are here this evening. Uh, we have Jessica Biggs on the end. We have Andre Smith in the middle. And we have Anusha uh, Thotakuria. And now you can all applaud. This is a good time. You can applaud now and at the end. Thank you, Thank you for, for showing up. This is wonderful. OK, Jessica, 90 seconds for you to chill, tell us uh, what your qualifications are and why you want the job. Absolutely. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for having us all here and your willingness to engage in this process as educated citizens, which is extremely important. These days, first and foremost, I am a mom to a bright and curious and intuitive fifth grader. Her name is Claire. And we send Claire to Galileo Scholastic Academy, which is a CPS magnet school in Little Italy. I am proud to have served as the principal of Burke Elementary School, which is a CPS neighborhood school um, straight through the park at 54th and King Drive for six years. When I arrived, Burke is the school that we, or a sort of school that we would consider to be underperforming, but it's also a school with a very rich and important history in Bronzeville. Um, the former Timuel Black was an alum, Margaret Burroughs was an art teacher um, at Burke before she founded the DuSable Museum of African American History. And I'm very proud to have leaned into accountable partnerships with community and with parents and with my staff um, to move that school off of probation over the course of my six year tenure. Today I work as an organizer on the Southwest side building systems of partnership between healthcare, behavioral health, social service organizations to support the holistic needs of students in neighborhood schools. And that's 15 seconds, I'm afraid to start a new sentence, so I'll pause. Andre Smith. Hi, first let me say uh, thank you all for inviting us. Uh, my name is Andre Smith and I'm a community organizer, community advocate, as well as um, one of my trades, I'm a deep sea diver, um, a finance manager, along with other, a lot of other things. Um, I'm running because for too long I have seen our public schools going in the wrong direction all the way from 2013, the closing of 50 schools and the black and brown community. Um, my time is getting short, so real quick. Other than that, uh, I'm the great grandson for the first woman of color in 1864, Carrie Williams, to file the first lawsuit in US history. Uh, Williams versus Brown, 100 years before, I mean Williams versus the Board of Ed, 100 years before Brown versus Ed, uh, to, for equal rights 
for color students and color teachers. Thank you so much. Anusha. Hi, my name is Anusha Todokora, candidate also in District 6. I'm a former middle school math teacher, and I'm proud to be a candidate for Chicago School Board. A bit about my family story here, um, they moved here to this country from India in the 90s. And the number one deciding factor for them when they were deciding where to settle and put down roots was where my brother and I could get the best public education. So from kindergarten through high school, I never had a problem walking to my neighborhood school safely and getting a high quality education. And that's what I want for every single child in our, in our city, and that's why I'm running. In my day job, I run Citizen Action Illinois, which is the state's largest and oldest progressive policy and political coalition. I work to build relationships with legislators in Springfield to pass legislation um, that makes healthcare more affordable, that protects consumers, protects our environment, and protects public education. And I'm running because I believe we need honest, ethical, and accountable leadership for Chicago public schools that will put our students first and close our, close our budget gap in a responsible way, especially with what we're seeing right now. So I'm running because I have the track record, the experience, and the relationships to bring our schools the funding that they need without taking out a short-term loan. Okay, thank you. Great. And if you could pass the mic to Andre. Uh, first question. And, um, of course, this started as a yes or no question, but current events have moved it to a one-minute response. So one minute. Um, Friday the 7, uh, school board members resigned, and today Mayor Johnson appointed six new members. Among other things, um, Mayor Johnson wants to take on a short-term high-interest loan to cover the cost of a new contract uh, the district is negotiating with the teachers union. CEO Martinez is not in agreement. Uh, what is your response to this controversy uh, and actions uh, taken to date? And we have several audience questions as well. So if you could include, uh, would you vote to fire uh, CEO Pedro Martinez? Why or why not? And uh, who among you will support the CTU and Mayor Johnson's plan to take out this same loan that I just mentioned? Well, thank you for asking that question, which is, that's a hot but button um, uh, question. One, I, I would not fire Martinez. Um, I believe that he should hold the line. You know, um, you got to look at, uh, and I, I think the mere idea of a payday loan is insanity. You know, um, we have to do a independent audit to see where the money is being spent. Everybody want to come up with new ideas and spending money, but nobody want to pay for it but the property owners and the taxpayers. And I'm tired of paying for people ideas that don't work. You know, with, they're taxing us out of our house. Is my time almost up? Timekeeper? Okay, excellent. Okay, so, um, I mean, other than that, we need an a, a independent audit to see where the money's went. In 2018, we were paying $6 billion for the budget. Now we're paying $9.4 billion for the budget. And the kids are not learning. They, they, you, when they graduate, they're reading at an eighth grade education. So we need to find out where the dollars are going. Thank you so much. Um, so I always talk about education as an investment. But the investment's a bit canceled out when you're paying the interest on a high interest loan. Um, in terms of Mr. Martinez, I don't think that there's reasonable cause to fire him right now, especially not in the middle of contract negotiations. I think that sets a horrible precedent. Um, and in terms of taking out a loan, I mean, the situation in our schools is very dire. I, I don't you know, mean to, over, um, to look over that. We have over 1,200 teaching vacancies. Our buildings are crumbling. We need money to fully fund our public schools and update our buildings and make sure we have smaller class sizes and to restore after-school programs which are being cut right now. But none of that should be done through a loan. We have to do that through increased revenue to fully fund our schools in a sustainable way. Because it's not fair to tomorrow's students, or even our current students who will be paying off the interest for this loan far into the future when they're taxpayers, if we take out this loan. So I'm strongly opposed to taking out this loan. And I'm breaking protocol, but we've just had another candidate come in who's a write-in candidate for District uh, 6. Yes. Uh, um, oh, hi. I didn't see you arrive. Um, the um, legal and voters' practice is to not include uh, write-in candidates in the forum. However, we've invited uh, Danielle to come, and she will meet with people afterwards, and she can pass out literature as well. 
Thank you, though. Got it. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. I just didn't want to speak over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, CEO Martinez. Um, it is critically important that we support and maintain Pedro in this role. Um, it's very telling to me as a former principal that 450 principals and administrators on their own drafted a letter in support of his leadership um, and recommending that he remain in his capacity as CEO. We're also moving through a massive transition um, into a 21 elected board, 21 member elected board, and it's critically important that during such a transitional time, we maintain some stability in terms of leadership. So um, I think Pedro Martinez absolutely has to stay as CEO um, until the end of his contract, and I see no reason to remove him. Uh, no, we should not take out a short-term payday loan. Um, we've learned this time and time again in our city. Um, we do need to look at sources of increased revenue coming into our district from Springfield, um, and we also need to take a hard look at um, our central office budget. Okay. Uh, next question on charter schools, and we have um, some audience questions that you might want to incorporate into your answer. So let me just read what we have here and then uh, these two questions as well. Um, what is your position on charter schools? Do you think the number of charter schools should be expanded? Do you think there are any uh, public school regulations that charter schools should follow? And if you could include in your answer, uh, what position uh, is the effect of charter schools on the public schools? And uh, does it make a difference in your answer if it is a, uh, a selective uh, charter school, if the, if the charter school is a selective enrollment or open enrollment? Did everyone hear that? But did yeah. And did you all hear what I just said? Because I can repeat the question. Where, you got it? Everybody got it? Great, okay. Any second? Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I used to teach at a charter school. I taught in a California Bay Area where there's a ton of charters, and the history behind that school was that, you know, California used to outlaw bilingual education. That was the history of it, and so people had opened up this school as a charter, a bilingual charter where I had taught at, and I know firsthand how charters can present opportunities for innovation outside of a traditional public school system. I also know how they skirt legal requirements because they focus so much on the outcomes that are measured by the state and by the district, um, and they only focus on tests, or maybe not only, but relative to what you'd be hope, um, hoping that a school focuses on. So whatever a charter could do that people feel like is better than what a traditional public school has, there's no reason that a traditional public school can't do that. And I think charters have historically diverted funds away from traditional public schools and that kind of left us in a downward spiral where families have no choice but to leave their neighborhood school um, for other options like charters or like selective enrollment or magnet programs and neighborhood schools are crumbling as a result. And some of the regulations I think we need to take a really strong look at are around special education and the rights that special education students have to getting their legally required minutes met. Um, I've seen a lot of shortcuts being taken for example, having a special education teacher simply in the classroom present, and that counting as all the students having met their minutes, as if that helped any student just having a person present in the classroom. Um, and sorry, I'm making sure I didn't miss the last part of the question. But overall, I think we need more accountability and transparency from our charters, as we should demand from every school. Uh, sorry, just wait a second. <laughs> you, gotta, you could work this out better, but to be fair, it has to go all the way. So when there was a move in the early mid-2000s towards charters, right, the idea was that if we could innovate, we could solve this complex problem that is public education. Um, and what we've learned since that time and what all the research shows us is that um, through the charter system, we've mostly managed to recreate the variability that we have in the public system. So merely by removing requirements and bureaucracy, we are not creating something at scale that is vastly different than what we do in the public system. That's what the research says. That said, in Chicago currently, we have 58,000 students who attend charter schools. I was a principal in 2013 during school closures and school actions and, and deeply felt the impact 
um, within school communities and within individual families and in students' lives when their schools were closed. So I very much feel that we have a responsibility to support those 58,000 students who are currently enrolled in charter schools. I do not desire to see any additional funds go to charters, and I do not uh, desire to see any additional growth in charter schools, but we are responsible for supporting the students who are currently there. I, I look for, or will work for, um, increasing charter schools. I will work for uh, increasing the funding. My son was um, in grammar school and CPS. The teacher called me and my wife in at the time and said that I, our, church, our son was um, basically illiterate. He couldn't read, couldn't function. And medicine was an option. We took him out of that school, put him into a charter school. He graduated. He was able to read. He went from there to urban prep. He, be, he graduated the top of his class in urban prep, captain of the football team, and, w and got 30 offers to college. And now he's at a college playing football. You know, um, so... I think every parent deserves the choice. Every parent deserves des deserve the chance. You shouldn't be locked in because of a union. You know, I think that's totally unfair, and every school needs to be equally funded. Okay. Um, 60 seconds. What is your position on magnet, selective enrollment, and other GO CPS schools and programs? Yeah, so um, I choose to send my own daughter to a CPS magnet. We live here in Bronzeville, down the street from uh, Pershing Elementary School, and she goes to a magnet school in Little Italy that we're very happy with. Um, for a long time, CPS has had a portfolio model where families have been able to choose the school that best fits them. Um, we've made that choice for our family. I was also a neighborhood school principal, and so I very much understand the need to make sure that our neighborhood schools are fully and equitably funded and supported. We cannot do that at the cost of our magnet and selective enrollment schools. We lost two paraprofessional uh, roles at uh, Galileo where Claire attends. Um, and those are supports and special education services that, those, that the students at Galileo need no matter what. Um, so we cannot rob Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, um, but I certainly support the maintenance of the existing magnet and selective enrollment system. Magnet schools, selective enrollment, private schools, charter schools, um, public schools. I support what works. You know, if it don't work, then we need to relook at it, you know, um, then try something different. You know, I think, again, it's very important for the parent to be able to choose whatever school and have the support. Those $30,000 per, per kid, per year, should follow that kid. You're the parent. You know what's best for your child. So you should be able to send your child to whatever school, and I think politics need to be out of education. I strongly support our selective enrollment in magnet schools. I don't believe any funding should be cut for traditional public schools. But at the same time, the quality of those schools should be what we have as an option for every child in every neighborhood. And that's not what we have. We talk a lot in Chicago about school choice. I believe that one of those choices should be an incredible high quality public school within safe walking distance for your child. And if you want to choose to send them to a different school with a language program, an arts program, a culinary program, or a selective enrollment program, then that should be a choice that you make. But it's a false choice if you don't have a great high quality public school in your own neighborhood. And I will work to improve the quality of neighborhood schools so families do have that as a choice. Thank you. Okay. And now um, a yes or no question. Are you in favor of school vouchers? Uh, raise your hand if you are in favor. Um, and uh, are you, and raise your hand now if you are against school vouchers. Okay. And the uh, closing is uh, 90 seconds, and part of it is so that you, people can take that question up separately. But we're going to move on. Um, I'm ready. You're up next. Um, CEO Martinez recently said, we will not be closing or consolidating schools before a fully elected school board is in place in January 2027. Please react to the statement and then tell us 
what is your understanding of community schools and how would you advocate for their funding and support? Uh, this is 30 seconds uh, because you all halfway answered most of this already. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I think as a board member that it's very important for um, each member to travel through the district to, to talk to the parents, talk to the principals and the LLC members to see how things work. To, n to see what's working and what's not working. You know, you can't just go to a board and just start voting without the ground input or the people that's actually their input. So those are the things that I would do and those are the things that I'm doing. Thank you so much. The first time it could have been a mistake, I'm joking. Um, so what we have right now is a two-tiered system that many people have likened to the Hunger Games. You know, you either get into a selective enrollment program or a magnet program, or unfortunately you have the choice, that's not a great choice, of your neighborhood school. And this two-tier, the stratified system has only been getting worse and worse with a larger gap between the quality of neighborhood schools and selective enrollment schools. So I strongly support prioritizing additional funding for neighborhood schools. That's funding that we need to have in order to prioritize it there. So I'll be a strong advocate for additional funding from Springfield and working with legislators to get our neighborhood schools the funding that they need. question uh, starts with a statement about closing schools and um, as uh, Martina said uh, we will not be closing or consolidating schools uh, before fully elected school board in 2027 and uh, what if you could react to that and as well uh, what is your understanding of community schools and how would you advocate for their funding and support absolutely um, like I mentioned um, I lived through the school actions of 2013 and the closings um, and felt how devastating they were for our communities. And what we're learning now is that we didn't actually reap any of the benefits that we intended, whether they be academic or financial. So I do not support um, moving towards closure. I fully support um, building strong, sustainable community schools. I also support um, partnering with our legislators in Springfield to fully fund the evidence-based funding formula, which would bring additional dollars back into Chicago Public Schools. <laughs> That's the tricky one. <laughs> okay, uh, 45 seconds. Um, how long have you lived in the sixth district? What issues have you identified that are of particular importance to the sixth district? Yeah, so the 6th District stretch, uh, stretches from Bucktown to Old Town down to 76th Street. I live in River West, and I've lived there for about two years. I'm originally from the suburbs. I've um, worked in state politics for quite some time, but now I'm getting involved in the city level. And the, the funniest thing is that you think that there's a lot of different needs from Wicker Park to Englewood, but a lot of the issues are pretty pretty recurring in terms of the crumbling school infrastructure, buildings with mold, lead, and asbestos that people don't want to send their kids to, overcrowded cra classrooms, special education students not getting the services that they need. And if that's the case in Wicker Park, it's the same issue that we're having in Englewood just to a much larger extent, of course, because of the historic underfunding and disparities on the south and west sides. So I would say that the, uh, the issues of building infrastructure is the top one. Okay. Jessica? I have lived and worked in the 6th District for the past 13 years, since uh, 2011. Um, having also served as principal here for six years, um, serving as a member of the Bronzeville Community Action Council, um, there are a number of issues that I think are extremely important. And I, th and I think that, first and foremost, is that of a fully funded, um, equitable education for every single student throughout the district, whether they attend a magnet, a selective enrollment, or a neighborhood school. Um, we have to get that formula right. Um, I lived in um, the 6th district. I would estimate around 46 years. I'm 57 years old. So basically almost, almost all my life I was born in the 6th district. Some of the issues that I see is that uh, when they closed the schools in 2013, which I fought against, um, our children now has to cross gang territory. So they got to leave a house that probably, where they probably haven't had breakfast or the house may be disturbed. So they leave that, cross gang territory, trying to figure out 
what direction they're going to make it to, to school safe. By the time they get to school, the teacher upset. She's fighting for a pension. She's fighting for a raise or, or job sta sta stability. And they're not being educated. So, you know, those are the things that I think that because of our time, you know, those are the things that I think that's a big issue. Great. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Jessica, you're up. Thank you. <laughs> um, question on equity and funding. Uh, how would you if, um, how would you evaluate evaluate and provide for capital improvement needs across 80 plus buildings, in particular? Um, but also, uh, how uh, do you plan to ensure that resources are equity equitably distributed across all schools, particularly those that serve disadvantaged communities? And I'm going to give you a minute, 60 seconds for that. So um, I've talked about uh, there's something called a deferred maintenance backlog in CPS, which essentially means all of those fundamental, whether it be lead paint or there is crumbling tile or there are leaky, unusable water fountains, um, that that backlog be prioritized. Um, we know that the deferred maintenance backlog is greatest um, in schools that serve our most under-resourced um, students and populations. So I would certainly prioritize that backlog um, both as a means to um, provide a, a better, more equitable space for all students. Um, and then I've also talked a bit about thinking about what we call design build um, and thinking about the whole scope of a project with any new construction that we might consider taking on. Um, it doesn't seem like we're in a position where we're going to be able to do that uh, in, in, in the near future, but that's a framework that I would encourage us to use um, should we embark on that. Capital needs. Um Right now, our schools are in dying need just to make it safe for our children, $3.2 billion, um, just to make it safe. Then, they, then it's a $14 billion um, just to repurpose and bring the schools up, up to date. So that's about $17 billion to $18 billion, besides we're in a $500 million deficit. So when you add those numbers up, besides the budget, it's $10 billion. So when you add those things up, what we're going to be facing when we go in is to try to figure out how to pay for all of this. You know, uh, besides the money is need to be uh, equitable spent, but we got to figure out where those dollars are going to come from. That's why I'm calling for a forensic audit or independent audit. So one of the differences between schools in Wicker Park and schools in Englewood is that when something happens, like a water fountain's broken or, you know, th there's something wrong with the floor or the ceiling, it doesn't stay that way for long in Wicker Park because the families raise the funds privately to do small repairs for the schools. And that's something that's not a possibility for every school across the city. So we need to prioritize funds from the district going to repair and improve the schools that need it most. I would support um, using the Opportunity Index, which is what's currently being used to distribute funding, um, also to prioritize what schools should get the most repairs and in what order they're prioritized. Um, I also know that that model is flawed, so making sure that we have um, on the ground input coming in from parents and educators about the experiences at these schools because what a, a, a water fountain leak looks like in two different schools can be very different in terms of the damage that's on the ground. So um, seeking that input and equitably distributing the funding. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, the question directly on the budget, and uh, I'm squeezing in a couple of uh, audience questions. Um, so uh, this is going to be, um, let's give this 90, uh, Ariel, okay? Because you've all been cut short on budget things already, so I'll give you just a little bit to catch up, <laughs> okay? Um, so. Given that CPS has a budget of over $9 billion, what strategies would you employ to ensure fiscal responsibility while meeting the needs of over 325,000 students? Add to that uh, audience question, what would you do to get the state to contribute to CPS pensions as they do for other school districts? And what budget experience do you have um, that, uh, with, with CPS or elsewhere? And, yeah, Andre. So I have um, over 10 years of um, finance manager, um, plus I was a loan officer that's doing with the number, dealing with the numbers, you know, to package a loan, you know, with the bank and things like that. 
So um, as far as the budget, you know, we're looking at 9.4, a little bit over, um, say, about $9.5 billion. Um, can you say the question again? Um, so, you know, what strategies would you use uh, to employ, would you employ to ensure fiscal responsibility? Um, and uh, and uh, how would you uh, uh, move the state to contribute to the pension? Um, most definitely you want the state to, um, to add a little bit as far as the pension. But, you know, again, as, as uh, I, can, I keep saying, you know, just like the mayor is saying to the, to the governor, we need more money from the state, and this, the governor is saying, look, I gave you enough. If you're not responsible with the money that you have, we have, we're talking $10 billion. 2018, we're talking $6 billion. What, our kids are failing. Where did the money, where's the money going? You gotta, you gotta, nobody in this room can say, this is where almost $10 billion are going and we're getting deeper and deeper in debts. When people haven't dealt with the budget, have never dealt with the budget and just going in there, um, coming up with ideas and it's costing the taxpayers, Look, we're going to lose our house, and we can't, can, we can't continue to, to do that. Thank you so much. <laughs> so in my work as a policy advocate, what I do is in Springfield's in session, I go down Tuesday through Thursday, and I work to build relationships with legislators and get their buy-in on key legislation so I can get to 60 votes in the House and 30 votes in the Senate. That's the job. And to do the job, what you need to be able to do is listen to people and build coalitions. Part of the challenge that we've been having in getting CPS the funding that we need is that it's been viewed as CPS versus everybody else. And the more that we kind of divide of just saying it's CPS versus funding for the rest of the state, we're not going to get our money. Because guess what, CPS legislators, Chicago legislators don't have the votes that they need to pass this bill by themselves. We need to work on building relationships. We cannot antagonize other figures, whether it's the governor, other state legislators, or other districts or municipalities. We need to listen and build relationships to get our students the funding that they need. Um, and I lead a nonprofit, and what I know as a nonprofit leader is how to make difficult decisions and how to prioritize what gets funded and what doesn't. And right now, too many things that I believe are necessities are getting cut. I volunteer with CPS as an after-school debate coach, and programs like debate are seeing an 80% cut in funding. And we're definitely going to pay the price for that down the line when we see that our kids don't have a safe place to be after school and that our parents don't have child care for their kids. So right now, we're in a dire situation, and we need people that can be accountable um, to advocating for our kids and the funding that they need in Springfield. Yeah, in response to your question, uh, there are really two key things that we need Springfield's help with. And, and one is the evidence-based funding formula that we've talked about, I've talked about, right? Um, CPS is currently funded at about 80% of the dollars that ought to come back into the system. And the other um, is Chicago's teacher's pension system is the only pension system in the state um, that is not also supported by the entire state tax base. Those are two things that I would like to partner with legislators in Springfield and importantly with the governor's office to shift. I think this is a really important moment that we are electing members to a board of education such that those who are elected represent a vast constituency. I agree with this piece around coalition building. It's not individuals who need to go down and talk to legislators. It is entire communities of people that need to talk to their state legislators and also to the governor's office to say, we need to make sure that the state supports our district um, in the way that they have said that they will. You also asked about um, budget experience. So, as a principal, each year um, I wrote, balanced, implemented, amended, managed a multi-million dollar budget. Um, so I have a vast amount of experience um, looking at and dealing with uh, school level and district uh, budgets. Thank you. Okay, a question from our Environmental Action Committee. Um, how would you support the advancement of lead-free water, clean air, and zero waste? How would this be reflected in the board's core values and beliefs and be evident in its mission, vision, goals, and policies? 
Wow. So I've been thinking about a lot about this question recently because just yesterday I was canvassing with the Sunrise Movement who endorsed me because of their support for green schools um, and my also support for green schools. Uh, the school that I coach at as a volunteer debate coach um, is in Brighton Park. It's on the southwest side. And there was one day after practice where I went outside to smell the air. Uh, well, I didn't go outside to smell the air, but I went outside and I smelled the air and it smelled like syrup. And when I asked what it was, um, the other teachers told me that that's a nearby factory that's dumping chemicals in, into the air and trying to mask it. And that doesn't happen in every school or every community in the city. It happens in some. And Brighton Park is on the southwest side, one of the school's um, areas that it's most impacted by this. Sorry, I didn't realize it was just 30 seconds, but continue in that question. Sorry. Yeah, it's a short one. Yeah, all the way down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, we know that this issue impacts our schools primarily on the south and west side. So not only is this an environmental issue, this is also an issue of equity. Um, this is a space where we need to work carefully uh, with both our city agencies and with federal agencies to make sure that we are remediating any lead pipes that are in our schools um, to address this issue expeditiously. It's a 30 second response. Yeah. I don't know how much yeah. more I could give you. Sorry, we're, we're really moving now, aren't we? <laughs> we're getting close to time, so I'm, go ahead, Andre. Well, that's a common, um, and it's sad to say, on the south and west side, lead, pipes and water, lead in the water, you know, even in our school system, that's why, you know, it's going to take $14 billion to overhaul mostly our schools and things of that nature. Nobody should be worried about not being educated, going to school safe, or drinking lead water. And that's why we need to put a task force together so that they can go through things like that and make sure that they report back to the board and we deal with it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to Jessica next. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh. Okay, uh, 45 seconds, all right? Uh, community engagement uh, is what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, how will you involve parents and community members in the process of approving district policies and decisions that affect their schools? Please include how you will work with local school councils in your answer. Um, thank you for this question. This is a, a core piece of my platform. It's a core piece of my leadership and a core piece of the way I make sense of myself. Um, I've proposed a couple of structures uh, by which to do this. Uh, one, I would like to host uh, learning walks on a weekly basis in District 6 schools with both community members and parents, uh, both to help to build bridges and relationship uh, between uh, folks in schools and those in the community, but also to develop a common base of knowledge. I also would like to uh, convene uh, chairs of local school councils um, on a monthly basis to bring those um, LSCs together to share their experiences. The experience of local school councils from school to school is very different. There's lots for folks to learn from one another, and there's also lots for me to learn as a board member by immersing myself in that space, listening, learning, and also sharing decisions that I need to make. So I will have um, a monthly meeting with the, S the LSCs um, virtual for those that just can't make it. Other than that, you know, they have to see you. Um, they have to see you, know you. So therefore, I would go to the schools so they can see me, so they can know me, you know, and we can talk. I can understand what's going on, and they know that they can, you know, reach out to me if something happens. What I would support is what I do right now, both as an organizer and as a candidate, the direct contact. Um, of course, I support like newsletters. I have a newsletter. I have social media. I have um, you know people that reach out to me. But I go and knock on people's doors and I call them directly. And people ask me, "Are you going to be you know this accessible after election day? No matter how the election goes." And that's a commitment that I've made. That if I get elected, I'll continue to knock on doors. I'll continue to make calls and meet people where they're at. And I think the best way to engage LSD members is to, by going to LSD meetings, um, but also engaging principals and school leaders and making sure that any important decisions that come before the board are rooted in community and LSD input. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, we uh, got a little bit of late start, so I'm kind of moving things along. So I'm going to turn this into a yes or no question. Um, many school boards across the country are getting involved in banning, uh, the banning of books and restricting certain subjects from being taught, for example, critical race theory. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, how many of you are in favor of 
getting involved in the banning of books and uh, teaching of certain subjects. How many are in favor of that? How many of you are against that? Okay, for the record, they're all opposed. Wow, that, that didn't really come out so well, but, but we all know. <laughs> Good enough. Okay, um, I think, um, Andre, you're up next. Okay. Um, so, and I'm gonna uh, squeeze in an audience question on this one too. Uh, how are you funding your campaign? Are you receiving support of money or in-kind contributions such as mailers, field canvassing, and consulting from any organizations, PACs, unions, or powerful wealthy individuals? How do, you, how do your positions align with these funders? And uh, an audience member wants you to specifically indicate if you are getting uh, such support from uh, Charter PAC or um, uh, I see to you, Pat. All right. So um, once again, as, as there's no shame in my game, I told you my son's history, my history in regards to why I support charter. And uh, that don't waver or change. Um, I experienced that. And I'm sure that, you know, some of you, you know, when you want good education, you're going to put your child in the best school. So um, Inc. supports me. Um, they're help funding my campaign, and I'm so excited about that because I didn't have to change my opinion and what I believe in to get their support. They supported me because of my stance and my experience. So, um, yes. Was there anything I missed? Uh, no, I guess not. Yeah. So I, I'm so proud in closing. I ran several times, and I, I, I raised $17,000. Not that I wasn't a good candidate. It's hard to ask somebody for some money because when you ask somebody something, you're in debt to them. Um, this way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I have raised over $40,000 independently for my campaign. And in addition to that, I have received funding from Chicago Teachers Union, from the Illinois Federation of Teachers, who I've worked closely with on many different advocacy campaigns, um, and other organizations who align with my values of supporting high quality public education. As you might see from some of the statements I've already made, that doesn't mean that I'm gonna be a rubber stamp for any decisions, and especially not a short-term loan. Um, I've been endorsed for my track record, for my experience, and the values that I have in making sure every child in our city can get a great education. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm beholden to any interest because I definitely have enough money to run an independent campaign on my own. Okay, Jessica. So I am the one person in this race who is not uh, supported either by the Chicago Teachers Union or by the Illinois Network of Charter Schools. That said, um, I have managed to raise $40,000 independently. Um, I have taken a $1,500 contribution from an organization called Leadership for Educational Equity. Um, and I am also supported by a variety of ward, not a variety, some sp very specific ward organizations across the district. I've been endorsed by Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle, and her fourth ward organization is supporting me. I'm supported by the third ward organization and Alderman Pat Dowell. I am supported by, oh, there's another, uh, the 32nd ward organization and Alderman Scott Wagesback. Thank you. And we're gonna go about six to seven minutes over. That's okay with everybody, since we got a late start. Um, you're up next, Anusha. Last question before closing statements. Um, is there an issue we have not addressed this evening that you would like to bring up? That's a great question. Uh, so when people ask me if there's one issue that you could fix, and you know, of course it's funding, that's a big issue that we have right now, but what would you do with the funding? It's early childhood education. The opportunity gaps in our city start as young as preschool and even earlier. We have a quality, um, a crisis in terms of the quality and accessibility of affordable child care, and a crisis in terms of adequate early childhood education programs. Um, we have issues with class sizes, with early childhood screenings. So I would start there, because those are the critical years for our kids, pre-K through second grade, where our investments can make the most difference. Okay. Jessica's next. Uh, one piece of my platform that we have not talked about tonight um, is that around strong staffing pipelines and leadership development for uh, staff and teachers at all levels of our district. 
Anusha mentioned earlier that we, uh, she mentioned a figure of 1,200 vacancies across the district. I imagine it could be quite a bit more. Um, and those vacancies are mostly concentrated on the south and west sides in some of our most critical positions like bilingual positions and special education positions. So I see it as fundamentally important to uh, create strong pipelines into those roles uh, to incentivize teachers. Thank you. Andre? I believe um, one of the issues that we're facing with is um, happened today, the mayor appointing six members. We have an election November the 5th, less than 30 days. What's, why so urgent? You know, um, it's so important for the Board of Education to be independent from the mayor. The mayor right now is the boss, and you are not going to be in subordination with your boss because you want your job. That's why those seven members resigned. My Thank time you. is up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, time for closing statements, and uh, they will be, uh, you will each have 90 seconds, and we will start with Anusha, Andre, Jessica. Thank you so much to everybody for being here tonight, uh, for our hosts, League of Women Voters, and um, sorry, I got to make sure I get the name of the church correct. Um, the First Unit Unitarian Church of Chicago, thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Anusha Thodokora. I'm a former middle school math teacher. I volunteer with CPS as a debate coach. I'm a policy advocate and advocacy leader. And I'm running because I believe every child in our city deserves access to a high quality public education. And the only way to get there is with seasoned and expert leaders who will advocate for the funding that our school needs. I'm really proud to have the endorsement of 11 state legislators, including State Representative Cam Buckner and Illinois State Treasurer Mike Frericks, who have endorsed me because of my leadership and my experience and values in improving high quality public education for all students. And for those of you that live in District 6, I would love to connect and hear some of the concerns that you have. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. No, you, no, Andre, you got it right. I got it? Okay, I got it right this time. Sometimes, choices is not easy. Matter of fact, making the right choice is difficult, especially at difficult times. We're voting on something that we never voted for in history. Chicago elected school board member. When our classrooms, some are overcrowded, some only have 30 in the building, do you have two different organizations fighting for power. And then you have the mayor. Look, it's going to be on the, the burden is going to be on the back of the taxpayers. We need someone that knows business, that knows numbers, and not accountable to anyone. And I'm your person. My name is Andre Smith, and my punch number is 103. So my name is Jessica Biggs, and I am proud to be running in the 6th District. I am running because my daughter Claire deserves something truly exceptional from her public schools, as does every other single student in CPS. I have the experience and the independence to bring that about. I am very proud to be running with a diverse coalition of supporters, everyone from our Education Committee Chair, Jeanette Taylor, who was a hunger striker um, at Diet, all the way to uh, Alderman Brian Hopkins in the second ward, um, to our finance committee chair, to our Cook County board president, have all stepped up to say, this is, this me is someone whose leadership we need in this moment. We need to have folks who are bridge builders, who can bring diverse points of view together. This is a deeply polarized moment, um, and I believe that I am the candidate who is able to do that. I encourage you to go take a look at my website. Uh, it's bigs4, the number 4, chicago.com. Um, I would love to hear from you. Um, I would love this to be the start of a conversation over a long period of time. Um, and I look for your vote. Punch number 101 here on top of the ballot. Thank you. And thank you. That was very, 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 very uh, enlightening. Uh, shall we all give them a round of applause? So um, 
All three have agreed to stay in the room for a little bit longer, spread out. As you know, um, when we do audience questions, it, they are directed to all three. But if you have questions you want to direct, uh, uh, ask directly from a candidate, uh, please uh, approach. Also, uh, Danielle, um, would you like to uh, stand up for a minute? Danielle Wallace is a write-in candidate, and she will be in the room also able to answer questions. Uh, at the back of the, as you go out, there will be a table, and the candidates will put their literature there if they've had a chance to bring any. Um, and uh, one last thing is um, pick up one of these. Uh, on one side, you can read uh, the League of Women Voters of Illinois' do's and don'ts for mis- and disinformation. On the other side, we're looking for people who, uh, the League of Women Voters is a, uh, in partnership with Common Cause Illinois for election protection. Most of you know that is 866 our vote. We're looking for people who would like to be election monitors or election watchers. And here on the bottom is a link. Uh, you can go to this URL over here or to the QR code to the Illinois Voter Guide. And the Illinois Voter Guide is now live. And uh, you will uh, find a link to this recording under uh, the 6th District, so you'll all be able to uh, point your friends to it. Also, uh, I think you all saw, uh, according to this, that there's a place that you can find it directly. You don't have to go to the Illinois Voter Guide, but the Illinois Voter Guide is just a great place. I always use it for the judges. Uh, when, you, when you put in your address, it pulls up um, an exact copy of your uh, ballot, everything that's going to be on your ballot. There will be a lot of people who will find out which school district they're in at that particular moment, I think. Um, and uh, uh, there's nonpartisan information on all of the candidates that uh, is right there. Uh, and in some cases, uh, you might find it interesting what, what the position is, like the water reclamation, the metropolitan reclamation. We, it's all listed there. But I always use it every time, even, no matter how educated I am on the topics. Um, for the judges. Uh, and you know there's what, some 30 judges that you have to decide whether to retain or not, yes or no, and the 14 bar associations, uh, their uh, recommendations are listed under each judge's name, so you can have a look. So thank you all for coming. We have another one of these for uh, those of you who have neighbors that live on the other side of Hyde Park, Kenwood, and Woodlawn. Uh, if you live closer to the lake, we will be doing the 10th district on October 21st, and that will be over Zoom. Um, so, and there's a flyer back there if you want to give it to a friend. So thank you. And, oh, thank you. Thank you, Reverend Dave, for hosting us tonight. Okay. Shout out of thanks to the League of Women Voters. Thank you, Catherine, so much, and your whole team. We have like a pretty stellar support team here from the League of Women Voters. We believe voting is a faith practice. Get out there and do it. And if you have trouble getting to the polls, let us know. We got people to help get you there. Uh, we also have restrooms here, <laughs> which I didn't offer at the beginning because usually there's someone else to talk about these things. But if you need something to drink, you need to use the restroom, go ahead and do that. And uh, folks are going to, I don't know if you want to have breakout space, uh, but, but we can get you set up. Thank you so much, and thank you, Asar, for taking care of our technology. Signing off.